you keep hearing about this mysterious Jennifer Griffin. Who is she? She's not here, but she's here in spirit. She is going to join us online now to talk about school and then family issues. There she is. Jen, we miss you. We miss you. There she is. If you need help navigating the LGS journey, this is the woman on our team who makes that happen. So Jen, take it away. Jeez, no pressure. <laughs> hey, guys. Um, Yes, I'm Jennifer Griffin. I am the Director of Family Support at the LGS Foundation, and most importantly, I am Theo's mom. And Theo is, uh, he just turned 20 on the 14th, so he's only been 20 for, uh, I have, I've only been without a teenager for five days, but it already feels great. Um, and I'm calling this talk, um, um, what I'm calling it, LGS, uh, what is it? I, I've got a piece of paper in the way, LGS Through the Lifespan, the novel. And the reason for this is, you know, it feels like this LGS life comes in chapters. And, you know, just when you think you've got something figured out, a whole new chapter, of course, opens up. So I can't advance my slide. I'm trying to, Jeff. Don't know why. There's a slide in there, folks. Anybody? Well, anyhow, I don't know if, can somebody advance my slide? It was working before. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, which one of these is your story? I mean, obviously all of our lives kind of are a mystery, sci-fi, whatever they are. I tend to lean towards the comedy but my particular favorite in this um, of these images is the uh, the smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. And let's face it, we are all very skilled sailors in LGS land. So I'm going to open up this book at uh, chapter one. And um, IDEA is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And it has four parts. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm only going to focus on parts B and part C. And like everything else in this crazy journey, um, part C comes before part B, go figure. So that is birth to three or early intervention. Uh, it's called early start in California where I live, but it, it, it kind of works like this. Your child is identified as having a developmental delay. It's just a delay at this point, okay? And from there begins what um, others and myself have referred to as alphabet soup. It begins with that first IFSP, which is the Individualized Family Service Plan. Um, and thus begins your world of acronyms that will lay out um, as, you, as you walk through this life. Um, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll be receiving this plan that will be helping them catch up. Um, it's not a delay or it's not a disability. As I said, it's a delay. And they, in there, you will find you will get services like OT, PT, more acronyms, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech, SLP, it's a speech language pathologist. Um, and then you can also receive services like, you know, medical or nursing or vision or hearing. And all of these are to be provided in what they call a natural environment, um, be it your home or, um, or a, a child care center. But there, it's not going to be it's not going to be a center based thing so it's not going to be something where they where they tell you to go to this particular center for these services for the most part it's really supposed to be in a natural environment and um, it's reviewed every six months it's updated annually and then when your child is about two and a half you're going to have the first of many IEPs but I'm going to get to that in a minute because there are other issues that you are probably facing at this time. It's been spoken of a lot over this last weekend. You know, you're, you're probably reeling from this new world that you're in, the, the diagnosis. Um, you may be exhausted, depressed, angry. Uh, you and your significant other might not be seeing eye to eye. There are a lot of, you know, struggles in, in partnerships during this time and well, throughout this whole journey. 
Uh, there might be a lot of expenses that you're being faced with. So um, I just want to, in each one of these chapters, I'm hoping to provide for you a couple of resources. And in this case, I, I, I've started with kidswaivers.org. Uh, if you, a lot of our kids are eligible for Medicaid waivers uh, it, during this period. And if they're not, sometimes like in California, you really can't get Medicaid or Medi-Cal until they are the age of three, unless the income of the family is low enough. So, um, because it is still only seen as a delay, not a disability. Um, but then that will be established and then you can get Medi-Cal pretty, pretty quickly, hopefully. Um, in other states though, you could be on a waiting list. So kidswaivers.org can outline the different types of waivers and it can also show you what it's going to be like in your state, what those waivers look like in your state. But the other really good resource is us. It's the LGS Foundation. When my son was diagnosed, there wasn't an LGS Foundation. And I can tell you that first conference that I attended was life-changing. Um, for some of you who this is your first conference, I can, I, I can only hope that you are experiencing that same feeling because I can tell you that there are people in that room right now that are super sad that I'm not there. And I am super sad that I am not there with you because some of my best friends in the world who just get me and I get them, they are in that room with you. And I hope, um, I hope they've represented us well. And I know they have. Um, I heard Carol, Kara did the worm last night. So, um, so, you know, we do know how to have fun too. Um, and, you know, also um, <laughs> uh, the, oh, okay. I'm, 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 I'm sort of going off, off, uh, off topic here. So I want to get back to the IEPs, the dreaded IEP. That is the, that is the scary acronym that I'm talking about right now. And let's get on, let's, get into that one, okay? Um, as I mentioned, you are reeling from this steep learning curve that you're on. When I attended my son's first IEP, I walked into a room and there were like 15 people there. I didn't even know why I was there. I was told it was his IEP, I think. I'm sure I was. I didn't even know what an IEP was. There was just all these people and then, then we talked about stuff. And then at the end I was asked to sign something and that's it. So let me tell you how um, the IEP works. But before I dive into that process, I'm gonna share two of the most important acronyms for this process. And that's FAPE and LRE. Um, IDEA states that your child is entitled to a free appropriate public education, FAPE, in the least restrictive environment. And I'm not gonna dive any deeper than that at this time. So let's, the process itself, it begins with what they call present levels. So the, the parents and everybody else are gonna weigh in on who this child is. And hopefully they're gonna say some nice things about your child as well. We don't wanna just hear all of, all of the, uh, the bad stuff or the, the stuff that makes us worried, but really we are focusing on the areas of concern. And then we're gonna determine who's gonna assist um, or we're gonna determine some goals and then we're gonna determine who's gonna assist in meeting those goals. So is it going to be the OT, the PT, the speech therapist, the teacher, et cetera? And then we move on to supplementary services and accommodations and modifications. So that could be um, uh, you know, busing or um, preferred seating or uh, an instructional assistant all those different types of modifications and, and uh, supplementary services. And at the very end, then we discuss placement. So where are these services gonna take place? Is it, is it gonna be in a special day class? Is it going to be in a school that's other than your neighborhood school? Um, is it gonna be in the general education environment? So, so this is what they call your offer of FAPE when it's all determined. So then now you're asked to sign it. Okay, if you agree with everything, you sign it. But this is where I recommend putting on the brakes. I mean, even if you're, you're feeling good, I suggest that you say to them, you know what, 
I'm going to take this home. I'm going to digest it and just really review everything I think I heard. And then I will sign it and get it back to you. And believe me, in our case, they don't even ask me to sign it most of the time. They'll just, because they know that, that that's a perfectly reasonable request. And, you know, there are a lot of single parents there or parents who might have to attend their child's IEP meeting without their significant other. Um, so if you're alone, that really is not okay. I think that I, I really recommend bring a friend with you, somebody who can take notes so that you can be fully present in that meeting. So just know, especially for those younger families um, who are newer to this process, you know, you don't realize that you are the major stakeholder in this enterprise. These services cannot begin without your signature. It's a lot of power. And I just wanna remind you that you're gonna be doing this probably for 19 more years, potentially. So whatever you've been told by a lot of, you know, well-meaning families, well-meaning, um, is don't go into it expecting a fight. You know, the, Tracy, I think, mentioned this yesterday. Educators do not get into this business for the money. They usually get into it because they like children and they want to help. So just if you're confronted by something that really does not make sense to you and you're feeling like they just said something that doesn't make sense, ask for help. Do what Karen did with her dentist. You know, ask for that person to, get, to be on your team with you. Because the I in IEP is the individual. It's your child. It, this, this is all about that individual. We are circling around that person. It's not about you. It's not about them. It's about your child. And if everybody can keep that in mind, the chances of success are going to be greater. And I can't hear the audience right now, but I'm gonna hold for laughter, hopefully. Hopefully. All right, laughter has subsided, let's move on. Okay, so IDEA Part B continued. I just wanna just kind of break it down into, um, into different parts. I mean, the, the um, elementary part is actually focused more on accessing the curriculum. So the same curriculum that the students in general education are receiving they're gonna to try to adapt that curriculum for your child. So it could be reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, history and science, anything. Um, if they're discussing bears, the OT and the PT and the speech pathologist, well, maybe not the PT, but the speech pathologist, they're gonna be trying to, to work with your child, bringing you know, bears into it or bats or whatever it is they're talking about, state history. That's all gonna be part of the, um, the focus at that time. But once they get to junior high, the focus will shift slightly and it will be more focused on activities of daily living. Um, so let's, let's, you know, let's make sure that they're, that they're focusing on things like personal hygiene and dressing and undressing. It doesn't mean that they're giving up all of the academics, but we wanna make sure that we're developing as many uh, skills of independence that we can and so, you know, if, if they're just teaching them to tidy up their desk, my son loves water, as most of our kids do. And I remember they used to do things like he would wash the dishes with an assistant, you know, somebody, an aide helping him um, to, to just sort of, he'd love it because he was playing in water, but they were teaching him an activity of daily living. Now, between the ages of um, 14 and 16, they're going to, they're, they're probably going to begin this transition beyond high school, that's the, the discussion will begin, not the actual transition itself won't, but they'll start, you know, talking to you in those IEP meetings about what do you envision for the future? So just know that that's, you know, that that is just something that you can, you can start considering at that time, but you don't have to have an answer. Now, if they are on, um, there's these two tracks, the certificate of completion or the diploma. If they are on, um, um, a diploma track, it means that they're, they're academically trying to keep up with their peers. That probably doesn't, that, that doesn't describe most of our kids. So they're going to be on a certificate of completion track, but 
it doesn't mean that they can't have the actual graduation experience at the end of 12th grade. Like they're going to wear the cap and gown. They're going to be handed something that looks like a diploma, but it's really going to be a certificate of completion. And this, um, you know, those who do actually get a diploma, they will then, their, their services will probably end. And you'll probably stop having IEPs and they will move on to something post-secondary. But for those who receive the certificate of completion, those who do not actually graduate with the uh, meeting the academic requirements, um, they'll most likely continue into a transition program post-secondary. Now, a lot of those programs are, um, are housed in the same place. They may be in your, the high school. Um, they might be off campus somewhere else. They might be in a local community college. Um, and these are still funded by your local education agency. But it's here that I want to describe or discuss, I should say, um, life beyond school during this period, because it's not just school 24-7. So I, I've, um, I've broken it down, of course, into these two areas. And so let's get the medical stuff out of the way. Uh, this often feels like it eats up our entire life. But, you know, the mental health needs of the caregiver have been discussed a great deal at this conference. And I'm so happy about that because you know, caregiver self-care and burnout and all of those things. I mean, Charles Wagner said it so eloquently when he was, when he, in his keynote speech, if you can remember back to two days ago, you know, he had to take care of himself if he was going to be able to take care of his child. And a lot of us, you know, we consider that we don't always do it well. I mean, we all fail at that occasionally. Nobody is consistently a great parent or a perfect parent. We're great, but we're not perfect. We don't need LGS to teach us that lesson. I mean, we're probably we're parenting and, and possibly failing our LGS child, but many of us have the, the great privilege of, you know, parenting and failing, typically developing children as well. So just give yourself a break. You're doing the best you can. And ask for help, try to find some respite, sneak in some time with your, your other children or your significant other. I mean, I think one of the best things I heard this weekend was William Wednesday from Kaylee Keene and what Jeannie Schnur said about, um, about how her kids get um, the, the, the birth date every month. Um, that day is the day that that child gets to be celebrated and they get to have the spotlight on them. So the LGS Foundation has, uh, we have a siblings page and the siblings who are my favorite people in the world. I have two older children who are madly in love with their brother and they are amazing women. Um, the LGS Foundation's website has uh, you know the the sib kits the vip the vip sib kits they are free so go to the sibs page and order your sibling if you haven't already um a sib kit and we will mail that out to them and also if you want to have them spotlighted on the siblings page please fill out that form and hopefully we'll get that up on our website as well um I think it was Dr. Nup that mentioned in her Friday morning talk about, you know, she, she was the one that started that discussion on the, on the comorbidities in LGS. Because we're not just talking about seizures, as has been mentioned many, many times. Um, and as Kara actually said yesterday, yes, I refer to them as my son's collection of ologists. We've got the neuro-ophthalmologist and the gastroenterologist and the rheumatologist and the urologist and the endocrinologist and you know we've recently added to that list the allergist who is not an ologist he's a gist but we'll let him in it's pretty overwhelming um and um the dmes oh that's an acronym um durable medical equipment our kids come with a lot of stuff the standards and walkers and wheelchairs and helmets and all of that um i need a bigger house for all the stuff that my son comes with but let's talk now about the fun, okay? I mean, I can honestly say that I have been able, Theo, my whole family, we've been able to bring fun into Theo's life. It's out there. 
I mean, Little League has the challenger division and that is a, a national organization and you'll probably find challenger divisions in your community, I hope. We did this for nine years and it really brings tears to my eyes when I think of, you know, sitting there on a Saturday morning and on a warm day, just watching Theo with, you know, maximum support by a very amazing volunteer um, helping my son just play ball. He also did something called the Best Day Foundation. My son surfed. It was like a, a car seat that had been bolted into a surfboard and he had a helmet on and everything. And he had, again, maximum support by some wonderful volunteers who helped him to just get out there and surf. So look up the Best Day Foundation. And then there are summer camps and all kinds of other like horseback riding and you name it. So if you are not part of our Facebook group, get on that group because people, you know, in your, who might live near you might be able to give you a wonderful resource. And there's also, of course, a, this is a shout out to our ambassadors because our ambassadors are super savvy on how things look in their particular state. So, and countries. So um, please, you know, please get out there and learn how to, how to give your kids some fun and make it, make it fun for them. Um, just know that you have to know, first of all, what makes my child happy? Who is he? And how to communicate that to other people. So here's a little tool. This is called a one-page profile. I think back in Columbus, I had one of these. I showed this at one of our, our um, conferences. And I, you know, this took me 20 minutes to put together. There's this website called Helen Sanderson Associates and they have templates and you can find templates even just, just go to Google Images template um, or find a template for a one page profile. And, um, I just, you know, you can, you can just customize it however you want. I mean, in this one, I just, you know, talk about what makes Theo happy, what people like and admire about him, what works for him. And then I also included our vision statement, his family's vision statement, how we want the future to look for him. Okay, so this leads me to, you know, uh, Karen was talking about this too, you know, the transition to adulthood. This is a process that really in our community tends to be addressed later rather than sooner. So when is it a good idea to begin? I mean, I said here now, but really, you know, when your child's around 14 or I mean, the school district mandates it, that they, that they begin these discussions, you know, roughly between 14 and 16. But the other stuff, that life stuff, I, I forgot to put in there conservatorship. And when, when Karen mentioned that, I, I got to tell you, my son had surgery a couple of months ago and he's 20. The first thing they asked me for is, you know, do you have permission to, for the, to, to uh, have this surgery? And I said, yes, we do. And I handed them that document. It cost us a lot of money, though, to get that document, which is not good. Um, you know, special needs trusts, they are trusts that, that protect your loved one's property so that they can continue to receive essential government benefits, such as Medicaid. Um, if somebody leaves, you know, your, your child some money in their will, or if they're thinking of doing so, and you have a trust established, make sure you tell them, please, do not leave money to my child. The government will take it. And put it towards his medical care. Leave it to my child's trust. Um, an ABLE account. This is a new thing. I'm not, I mean, it's newish in the last few years. And it's the Stephen Beck Jr. Achieving a Better Life Experience Act or the ABLE Act. And that, that aims to ease the financial strains faced by individuals with disabilities by making these tax-free accounts available to cover, you know, the qualified, um, uh, disability expenses. So I'm not going to say much more about those things. Um, I am going to offer you a couple of resources here. The ARC, the National ARC, has a Center for Future Planning, and they have on that, you can, they have a tool. It's a build your own plan tool. So there's a lot of information about, you know, um, trusts and ABLE accounts. And then there's, you know, um, the ssa.gov slash benefits, um, that's where it's SSI or supplemental security income. 
pay, they pay benefits to adults and children with disabilities who have limited income and resources. So we're just starting that, that process now for my son. Um, and so SSA.gov will walk you through the application process, um, but in the interest of full disclosure, I can tell you that this process can be daunting, sometimes not user-friendly. So please bring your patients of which I sometimes don't have any. Um, and this last really good resource is uh, the Family Caregiver Alliance. You know, when I was doing research for this talk, I, I came across this website and they have a lot of really good, it's really user-friendly and a lot of good information. It's caregiver.org. Um, and they have great information about, you know, these types of issues. And just know that, you know, these issues that you're experiencing in this chapter, they are going to be new and overwhelming and rage inducing at times. Uh, you know, you've probably grown used to or, or you're becoming used to um, this, this small business that you have grown since the beginning of diagnosis. So guess what? You're growing a whole new business when you get to this stage. Still more paperwork than you could ever imagine. So if that doesn't keep you young, I don't know what will. So this one's, this is the hard one, right? This is the most challenging. Um, this is where we have to confront um, the mortality reality. You know, I am not gonna be here forever. I mean, I think I am, but I apparently I'm not. Um, so what is the future gonna look like for Theo? All of our children, you know, once I'm not in the picture or not able to care for him anymore, is it, how will his days look? It, it, is he gonna be in a day program? Will he have a job? I mean, some of our kids might even have jobs. Will his siblings care for him? I hope not. You know, I hope it'll be paid staff, but will we be able to maintain committed and caring and capable paid staff? Hmm. Who is gonna care for him? And I always say, not just care for him. More importantly, who's gonna care about him? Who's going to love him? Because I insist that everybody continue to love Theo because he is worthy of love. All of our kids are. Uh, the system, again, is not set up for this. You know, funding to disability programs is abysmal. My approach is that I, I have, I have to become my son's voice. And at the legislative level, I have to become my son's voice. I only have one thing, his story, our story, our family's story, this four chapter novel is it but I have to condense that to be like a one or two minute le uh, elevator pitch for lawmakers. But it, it's really an uphill battle. I choose to take it on. I hope that you'll consider joining me. You know, the ARC has state branches. So the ARC of California, where I live, I'm a member. I get their Monday morning memo every Monday and Sometimes there's a calls to action where you just have to sign a petition. You know, it's not, it's not completely overwhelming. At the Every Life Foundation has um, the Rare Disease Legislative Advocates, RDLA. And this is something that we are, we have just recently joined this group. And um, we attended their Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill virtually in February. Some of our advocates did. We continue to do that in the summer. They also have you know, um, um, opportunities to meet with your legislators in, in when they're on their summer break and they're back in the community. It's really, it, it can seem daunting sometimes to be an advocate, but um, it doesn't have to be. And if you join our advocacy team, we can teach you all about it. It's really just that one thing, your story. So lastly, um, I wanna share with you something that I shared at, um, at the Seattle conference. It's called a system support map. It, it's a bit of a scary snapshot of my family's LGS life. And I will bet that your life looks like this as well. 
I'm that little teeny person at the center of it all. And from me comes all of these other responsibilities. And that's the reality of our lives. And most of us can do this. Like I said, you know, I've turned my novel into a bit of a comedy most of the time. I don't like to be sad. Sometimes I am. Uh, sometimes those rough seas do come in. But I just want to, um, to continue to have hope in my novel. I want it to have a happy ending. So now it's time to write your own LGS story. And I thank you all very much. And I love you all. And I miss you all. Thank you.